The first part of this is a little interactive. Um, I have a couple questions for you, just to show of hands. Um, who's heard of ARIO forming or arrow forming? Okay, good. I didn't make it up. See, it's real. All right, everybody saw the hands go up. Okay, there's a good reason to consider the ARIO forming from the beginning of Mars settlement, Mars exploration. It comes down to economics. Uh, I'm gonna tell you a little story. There once was a farmer in California. He wanted to grow almonds in California. The problem was that California did not want to grow almonds. So he did what humans have done for 15,000 years. He changed California. He redirected water. He worked with politicians to get large water reservoirs built. He got special deals on the water and then had it diverted to him instead of people that need it in a drought. He did a lot of work to make these almonds work in California. And all the work he did, the vast majority of it in terms of the mass and energy and time and money, was on altering the landscape. And this is not a new story and that farmer was not clever. He was playing a very old page out of humanity's playbook. In fact, this is the farm we're talking about, and this is basically the same bright idea in Angor Wat. Uh, recognize this city, anyone? All right. This place crashed and burned soon after it rose in glory because they couldn't upkeep the irrigation system. Um, trying to keep water going where you want it to in a landscape is massively expensive to start and even more nightmarish to continue. So after a century or two, their little experiment and civilization failed and they went back into the jungle. So, when I say it takes a lot of energy and time um, and matter to alter the land, we have case studies, 15,000 years worth of them. Here's the big dig in Boston, and it illustrates another principle, which is it's a really bright idea to alter the landscape and terraform and you know change the land at great expense when the land's empty, but it becomes extremely expensive when the land's occupied. So once you've built up civilization, life, organisms, infrastructure, suddenly that becomes 10 times the prospect just to keep it running. That's why we keep crashing and burning. It's much easier to build the big dig when it's empty. It's doable in the middle of a thriving Boston, but to keep it going 200 years from now is even more expensive. At some point, structures want to be completely destroyed and rebuilt from scratch. And that's the only way to keep them going. We know this because we used to live in an environment of nature where every component in the environment lived a, life spot, a, a lifespan and then crashed and burned and completely got destroyed and, and reappropriated. This was sustainable but miserable. Nobody wants to go back to this. And so far, we've had a binary option, living like this or altering the landscape wherever we go. Then we get one of these bright guys who's definitely proven that he's clever. I don't know if I'm as clever as him, but I know that um, he isn't the be-all, end-all. And when he wants to nuke Mars to make it into Earth, he's borrowing from that same old boring playbook. There's another playbook, though. As of 10, 15 years ago, my microbiologist friend, who was so cocky telling me, Jason, the stuff you dream of can't happen for 50 or 100 years, he called me up. He said, you madman, I'm terrified. I just realized today that the CRISPR machine at my work only cost $10,000, and I could sneak it home and play with it in my garage and make a form of influenza that kills everyone on Earth. And so could anyone else with my degree and $10,000. That's how far into the future we are right now. And that's how far beyond simply breeding animals and plants and hoping for the best results we already are. So we don't have a binary choice between accepting nature as it is or altering the landscape and environment. This is the third route. And as often in engineering and other problem solving, the third option was the hidden one and is the best one. For thousands of years, we've known how to adapt the vast dead parts of our environment to better suit the thin skein of living beings on it. Um, the problem is, like, it's extremely expensive to do so. It, it uh, modifies vast amounts of material, 
It requires vast amounts of energy, time, maintenance, attention. How much energy, time, or material does it take to keep a frog producing glow-in-the-dark ink on its back once you program it to do that? You need to remember to buy crickets every couple weeks. That's it forever. That's the power of area forming. So what would we do with area forming? How would this help on Mars? Well, right now, we accept it as a given that we can't go outside on Mars. We will boil. Our liquid can't stay liquid inside us, and we sure aren't happy when it turns into gas. So we have examples of why that's not confining. We already know of cases on Earth where we can do better than that. Here's a water phase diagram. The triple point is where water doesn't know what it wants to do. And I'll run up on the stage real quick and show you where Mars is. Here's Mars, and that's why right now we're facing a tremendous engineering challenge. We could try to move all of Mars away from that triple point into the liquid stage. Just guess how much energy, time, and maintenance, and construction, and risk that involves. Or we can try to move the triple point a little bit and modify just where our bodies can go relative to it. We have reason to believe that's entirely doable. We know it's doable because of this guy. We're so daunted to walk around without a spacesuit because we're so afraid of a measly 14 pounds per square inch of differential pressure. This guy goes from the surface where we live to the bottom of the ocean and for three hours fights giants and he doesn't run out of oxygen and he holds his breath the whole time and he doesn't implode. He rises back to the surface in much less than an hour even though our astronauts take a couple days to fully adjust safely back to life on Earth from an environment that's much less different than the surface. If this is physically possible, for him to go play around without air for three hours as a mammal just like us with a big brain and lots of metabolic needs and to come back almost instantaneously without a stroke, without cardiac failure, we can do the same thing. He's switching pressure to a point where he has like a ton weighing on every square inch and then back to nothing. We can switch from having 14 pounds to nothing and back. This is radiodurans. Dinonychus radiodurans is a bacterium uh, that can take a licking and keep on ticking. You can nuke this guy. He'll keep working. He has special proteins that basically amp up the rate of repair for DNA. If we're afraid of a sunburn walking around on the surface of Mars, all we have to do is borrow from him. That sounds so blasé and naive. It sounds like, Jason, you know, you're such an amateur. How could that be possible? Well, I lost my tardigrade slide, but how many of you have heard of a tardigrade? Okay. So we know where the Martians are, right? They recently took the protein out of a tardigrade and put it in human tissue. And the particular protein was the one which allows it to resist radi radiation damage. It did the same thing in human tissue. It didn't take them three years of trying. It didn't take monstrous Frankenstein creatures and you know experiments they can never tell the public about. It was very simple. The human tissue was in no other way different than before. This was Martian human tissue. This was tissue that would keep you from getting skin cancer on the surface of Mars. So we have reasons to believe that area forming is possible. And as I said, the beauty of it is, once you invest in it with tremendous foresight and care and a little bit of energy, money, and time, and you get it right, then someone like Mr. Carter here at the center of this classic family tree becomes a self-replicating piece of infrastructure. You don't need to build an environment that's safe for humans. If you build humans that are safe for the environment, they continually self-replicate it. They repair it and they replace it without any further investment of energy. And we have a fun time doing it. And it won't stop ever. So, while we go to Mars and we try to get the air pressure up and a little bit of shade to protect us from the radiation, and we try to make it a little warmer, I'm asking that we at least bear in mind that there's two ways to make an almond farm. Thank you.
that was pretty quick. So, yeah, questions? Right. In fact, technology yeah. like CRISPR are certainly useful. Yeah. But they require you to already know I need to change this specific DNA. That's not CRISPR. Right. For the changes that you're talking about, such as the pressure change, mm -hmm. uh, do we have a pretty good idea of what specific changes you would need to make to do Can you repeat the question? Yeah. Real quick, hey guys, when this is up, goes out on the internet, no one will hear you. I can repeat the question. If that's helpful? Okay. I'll try to do it justice. You're making a great point. When we go to CRISPR and we say we want to play God, um, which is funny because we, we're always playing God, but let's, let's run with that language and say, okay, now we're really playing God, really getting cocky. We have to know what we're engineering, um, especially I think you alluded to the fact that if it's a large-scale effect, it's not just changing the chemistry of the tissue but actually creating a large structural effect, that takes a lot of foresight or a lot of brutal trial and error. And there's no really no third way. So he asked, do we have any indication of where we're trying to go, exactly what script we're following here? I think there are some indications already. I think that when you study, um, for instance, some of the creatures that can survive vacuum, you start to realize what kinds of tricks need to be done uh, with water. Uh, if the water does go below freezing and crystallizes, then you need to make sure that the, the cytoplasm doesn't rip apart all the machinery inside of it. Um, and that's a bad day, but it's better than if you weren't ma modified in that way. There's other ways to keep the, the tension, tensile forces um, so that the water remains under pressure at even just greater than like one PSI will keep it liquid. Yeah. Well, yeah, and we're also rapidly converging on a situation where we can simulate parts of an animal. So we don't even need to sacrifice mice for this. But it might happen, right? So let's, yeah, that might involve mice. Um, yeah, I'm thinking more in the terms of partial organisms and testing things like, uh, you know, a, a partial tissue assembly. They're, that's one of the most ethical routes forward where we are seeing the, the possibility of certain, you know, certain anomalous things that will allow a, a fetus to develop without any brain. Sounds nightmarish, right? But the Big Dig was nightmarish. And Angor Wat was ni nightmarish when it collapsed. So, yes, there are ways to pursue this ethically. Right. So I, I think it, it's, you know, I know it's at a, it ends up at a different scale. Right? Yeah. So, but I, that sounds really challenging. I will, I will add to your point instead of opposing it. When I say that it takes more foresight, more intelligence to pursue the third route here, it, it does by a factor of 100. When you look at how a sperm whale does its magic trick, it involves every part of the whale. It involves changes to blood pressure and the way that the, the walls of the circulatory system respond to high blood pressure. It involves changing things like metabolism and how the brain functions, what kind of brain state the sperm whale goes into. You have to change um, some of my favorites that might be uh, low-hanging fruit on the pole. Are, um, there's evidence that sperm whales have multiplied the um, the oxygen absorbing tissues inside their muscles by a factor of six, and they've um, multiplied the, uh, the structures inside their red blood cells by a factor of 10. And they've also tripled the number of red blood cells in their blood relative to us. You add all that up, and it turns out that they've basically supercharged their oxygen storage capacity until it's three hours fighting, sperm, you know, fighting squid at the bottom of the ocean, and they're not tuckered out. 
um, it's trickier for the transitional stuff. Exactly how do you develop a sense inside a creature so that it can make the transition quickly without stroking out, having a heart attack, and so on? That sort of um, hydrodynamic aspect, I think, will be the most challenging part. Hi. All right, I want to get him on record. He pointed out some cool ideas, too. Um, there are people like Wim Hof who experiment with ways of holding your breath longer, doing better in cold environments. There are also genetics that lend people to storing more brown fat and being able to generate heat and survive cold better. And I think also, um, what was the other um, low-hanging fruit you mentioned? That's right. So there are divers in the Pacific Islands who have, for generations, basically bred themselves into having larger spleens, the same way Peruvians have larger lungs. And they use those spleens to basically juice their blood with extra red blood cells and extra oxygen capacity when needed. So they're able to dive and be active underwater hunting for 10 or 15 minutes. Um, so already we have proof humans can adapt. Right now, if you're on Mars and your suit rips wide open, you have 10 seconds before you black out, and your buddies have 60 more seconds to take you to safety before your blood boils and your heart fails. If we can get that from 70 seconds to 700, we might find ourselves a lot less terrified of the prospect of being there. And the spleen squeeze and such maneuvers are part of it, absolutely. Yes? So, uh, in Jurassic Park, <laughs> Yes. And he was talking about dinosaurs, we're talking about humans. Yes. So maybe this is a possibility from a technical perspective, but what are your thoughts on whether we should? I think that there's ethical risks in both directions. If my grandchildren live through an Earth apocalypse and they're left living like the Neanderthals on my previous slide, they're going to wonder why I didn't try a few things that I had in mind. They're going to wonder why I spent literally 99% of my energy on watching porn and playing World of Warcraft because God didn't want me to play with him. They're going to wonder why I didn't send 1,000 people to Mars and 2,000 to Antarctica and 10,000 to some facility in the desert to try a few things. They're going to want us to have tried everything we thought of to avoid their catastrophe. And... I know the 20th century showed us what we can accomplish if we don't care about ethics in the pursuit of science. Um, Japan and Germany and the US have done some amazing things in that department. Um, I think this would have to be an all volunteer process. But again, that's back to the ethics of people going to Mars in general. Um, if you think it's at all ethical to let someone go to Mars and basically waltz their butt into a one way meat grinder then it's not a big step to ask that maybe they also be invited to try out an injection of this or that along the way. And uh, my Navy SEAL friends you know, say, like, they get stuck with needles all the time because once you've agreed to risk your life for a venture, it's very easy to say, yeah, I'll risk my life in more than one way. Yes?
there's two ways to, to play that. Because he said, you know, I'll re reiterate, he broached the issue that if we're really successful in this regard, we might end up with two species. That humans might not be the same species. And you can't just date a girl from Earth and have fertile, happy kids. I'll get to you very much next. OK. Five minutes? OK. Um, one approach is to try what the sperm whale does, which is to become a, a very amphibious creature. The sperm whale is very happy to spend its whole life at the surface. It just has that alternative capacity. We're all built that way. All of us, if you make us enough sleep deprived, we turn into murderers. If you, you know, put us in a cold environment, we remember how to shiver. So we all have those switches built into our epigenetics. But the real issue is, what if things just diverge too much? Evolution tends to say that there are a few inevitabilities in an evolutionary system. One is, there is divergence. There's a constant heat flux and radiation background everywhere that causes mutations and divergence. So evolution is in an environment where the agents are constantly multiplying and becoming more different. And the pattern we tend to see is that one of the main ways two things to diverge is that they create um, an economics of marginal utility, not marginal utility, but um, you know, basically complementary roles. So you get a population of plant-eating mammals, and one day one of the ma mammals eats its kin. And it does well with that living, and eventually you have wolves and sheep, and not just sheep and grass. But the nice thing about evolution is, if you let it play out long enough, the friction between any two groups or species tends to minimize. So divergence drives conflict. Conflict iterated upon in any sort of game eventually converges on a sort of minimal friction relationship. That's probably what we can hope for, especially as we get to the point where you have humans that can't possibly come back to Earth because they're swimming in the clouds of Jupiter. You want to make sure that, yeah, both species don't have the upper hand on each other, have a mutually beneficial relationship, and that it's pretty friction free. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much.